we have looked at so far a number of systems that uh, encompass or capture various phenomena in this uh, circuit. So we looked at RC uh, elements uh, which constitute uh, the electrode, the uh, across the glass capacitance, uh, the narrow channel here forming the resistance, the capacitance across the membrane. So we looked at circuits which are RC, right? Uh, what what happens if uh, across the membrane uh, channels open up? Uh, we looked at capacitance compensation, right? So these are all basically uh, linear circuits, meaning uh, if you um, input sinusoids here of a particular frequency f1, uh, anywhere here if you measure, you can get again a sinusoid of uh, frequency f1, but maybe at different amplitudes and different phase with respect to this. Okay, so uh, it will not have any other new frequencies uh, present anywhere in this network. So it's a linear system. And also um, it is not having any elements, at least in this passive circuit, which will vary with time. So it is time invariant. Now, um, time invariant. Uh, so when you have an LTI system, basically this whatever trans function between the input and any of these po reference points would be uh, captured by uh, impulse response function. Okay, And so there should be a transfer function corresponding to that. There should be a transfer function. This is what we have learned in theory. So these are all basically the point I'm trying to make is all linear time invariant systems. Of course, if the channel which is opening up is a voltage dependent channel and so on, then non-linearity comes into picture. Um, and there could be also uh, time dependence coming into picture. So because of which, if these things will make it, uh, this will, be, will not be linear time invariant. And then it may not be captured by a impulse response function and there cannot be a transfer function and so on right so as long as it's linear then these things follow now uh, all this we have dealt with so far is passive circuit which are captured by linear time invariant systems now another important uh, linear uh, element which comes in capturing something happening in the brain or maybe in externally in your designs is an amplifier a linear amplifier and amplifiers are linear um, in a certain regime okay linear in certain regime in certain regime of operation meaning things like it you should not drive it uh, so much that it will saturate that one uh, uh, simple case where uh, linearity breaks down when it saturates. So we'll see what that means when we actually build this system. But before uh, going to deal with amplifier, I would like to um, uh, you to look at what uh, is a feedback system because many of these amplifiers and many of the network elements in the brain uh, with the multiple uh, neurons or even in, in, in homeostatic mechanisms here, you will encounter feedback. Okay, so this is an important uh, element in control and you already saw how a voltage clamp is implemented using a feedback. So uh, feedback is uh, there to stabilize systems, to maintain a set point and so on. Okay. So a general uh, feedback system uh, can be sort of uh, looked at uh, in this way. Okay. So let us uh, look, there is a block here which has a certain gain, let us call that A. This input is coming to it, let us call it I. Okay. And there is an output here, O. And in this system, O equal to A times I. A simple uh, system uh, where output is simply scale version of the input. So you can immediately see it's a linear system because if you do 
i1 plus i2 then output input equal to i1 plus i2 then this o2 equal to a uh, i1 plus i2 uh, equal to a i1 plus a i2 and so on and so you can immediately see that it is a sum of integers so this is o1 o2 which are if the individual inputs were given right so it's a linear system and it's not changing with time so it's a linear <coughs> time invariant system now let us modify this to have an element here which let us call a summer okay a summing element and then we take this output and then feed it back through a scaling factor beta maybe another uh, element like a or something else it doesn't matter something which does this scaling and then we subtract it from here so there's a minus so what comes here is uh, i minus right o into beta yeah so given this case now it is no more this it's no more this not this now we're going to create a new derivation for what happens here right so what will be o now o equals to whatever goes in here into a what goes in here now i minus o b so a into i minus o beta right that's what is going in here now if you expand it and uh, take o terms to the right a terms to the left then it will be uh, uh, i terms to the left so a i you know, equal to o plus a o beta so it should be equal to o into 1 plus a beta which would mean that if i calculate the new o by i right o by i is equal to this term will come here right i went there so a by 1 plus a beta so this is the output relationship for this entire system now this entire system here if you look at the single system after having introduced this feedback element now we have the response of the output as a by 1 plus a beta now suppose we take the case where this a is very large okay a a large that would mean that a beta would be much greater than 1 and then under this condition o by i equals equals a by a beta because 1 is negligible compared to a beta equal to 1 by beta which means in this once you introduce this feedback and when the gain is large a compared a is large compared to beta right then your transfer function o by i is only dependent on beta quite often it is very easy to make a uh, very large a devices like this which are not very precise the only requirement is a is very large and very inexpensive beta which are very precise so we can use precise cheap beta and very large a inexpensive such gain units to create a very reliable gain system okay so that is one of the ways in which feedback uh, works the, so in general the relationship is this right a by one plus a beta so this general feedback system Now, when there are multiple inputs, outputs, and so on, these things can become matrices, and the 
analysis can become a little more involved and which would be what would happen if you are looking at systems like in the brain. Now here is a uh, element, uh, an integrated circuit which can act as this black box. Let us see where we can look at it. So here is a, such an element which is an integrated circuit. As you can see there are uh, a number of uh, uh, legs that it has, right, and uh, um, eight of them in this case, and each of them are making electrical contact to some semiconductor circuit inside this plastic package. Okay, so it, it's not important for us to know exactly how this uh, inside this work. We only need to know that there is a black box which uh, can give this kind of uh, gain to voltages. Okay? So if you look um, inside um, uh, in this kind of what is called an operational amplifier. So inside this is one unique like this, at least one. The, I mean, some of them there may be two in this particular operational amplifier there are two units. Uh, um, for, for now let us consider just one unit. And so, as we said, it has a unit inside like this. This is the non-inverting input. This is the inverting input. Let us say. Now, um, the I. Okay. And then, of course, this is A, B, I. It gives high gain. And then, through a small resistance, R0, it is outputting the O. Okay, so this Ri is very high. Large. Ro small. A large. So these are sort of basic uh, requirements. And actually when this is uh, plus and this is minus, Ro, so we can actually write Vo equal to, in this case, minus A vi because i have used vi in this manner vi with respect to this so because it's inverting input we have to write minus a vi okay. if it was vi with respect to this then it would be a vi okay. so given that uh, um, scenario now let us see how this unit which is uh, like the uh, a in this block right now we need to figure out how to apply this beta so that we can get a stabilized gain so that's the idea okay so how do you manage this beta which has to be fed into a negative input so let us take a feedback element like this which i call r2 and commit it at this point and our input is fed into it through uh, uh, in R1 okay and this point is the reference okay. so we have V up here and we have V in here and we are interested in knowing what's the effect of this connection in producing VI so what will be vi so can we write down vi vi equals right it will be effect of this here plus effect of this here which is like because it is a linear system now um, why would this be uh, a linear system because it is a times this right so it's a scaled uh, version of the input there is no other operation happening in this system in reality when you look at practical op amps like this there are limits to which this output can fluctuate okay so uh, and that would make the output saturate and so linearity may be lost so in all our discussion we are assuming that this system is um, um, operating in the linear regime okay where this is valid now how is it that i can produce an output video greater than a bi that's because Actually, this is powered by supplies, which is plus VCC, 
by the free field search. So let we don't have to go into the details of how this happens, but because this VCC are much larger than VL, of course, VO in principle can fluctuate in the range from minus VCT to plus VCC. Okay, uh, so uh, I, I will leave uh, that explanation at that. So we are going to write down VI in terms of VIN and VO. For that, uh, let us uh, write effect of VIN here, which is VIN into this point when this voltage is this is considered this voltage source. So this point is grounded. This is very small, negligible. So voltage here will be because of the voltage divider these two. So R2 by R1 plus R2. So that's the effect of this voltage here. Right. And then what will be the effect of this voltage here? Actually, when you consider this voltage, this is grounded. So plus VO into R1 by R1 plus R2. So that's the effect due to this voltage. So because it's linear, we have the superposition of these two. And that's in the action, right? Now let us uh, scale all this by A because we are interested in figuring out VO. So we need to remove this VI to have this expression have only V in and VO because that's the whole system we are interested in this this block, so, right? Which is equivalent to this block. So we are just in that. So let us scale this. So A V I equal to A V in uh, R2 by R1 plus R2 plus A V O R1 by R1 plus R2. Now we can rearrange the terms uh, and substitute for A V I. What is A V I? We know that this minus V O. So minus VO and then we take all the VO terms to add this up. So this will do so R1 plus R2 equal to A V in R2 plus A VO R1. Now we segregate all the VO and V terms in the right and left. Minus R1 minus R2 this coming to this side minus A R1 right equal to a V in R2 V O by V in is equal to V O by V in what's the scaling factor because of this new circuitry that we have added into this uh, high gate system is equal to A R2 by minus of R1 plus R2 plus A R1 right which is equal to minus of r2 this by i'm taking out r1 plus r2 r1 plus r2 so into a by by r1 plus a r1 by r1 plus r2 right now we have a form which is uh, in which we can set the limit where A is very large and this will become A R1 by R1 plus R2 so be equal to minus R2 by R1 plus R2 into R1 by R1 plus R2 is equal to minus R2 by R1 so this is our net gain between this and this okay and so with this negative feedback we have been able to get a system whose gain is minus r2 by r1 which is completely set by these two resistors which are which can be made very accurately and inexpensively and we could make such a unit with very high gain without really bothering about the accuracy of A and so using this very high gain not necessarily accurate A we are able to get an amplifier with a gain minus R2 by R1 whose 
decision is only governed by after and after. Okay, this can be inexpensive. And so, of course, this can be tuned to the requirement that we want. So, this can be mass manufactured with high gain, and each individual user, depending on his necessity, can set the gain by just changing R1 and R2. Now, let us um, look at one specific amplifier and uh, look into the details of how we will go about uh, implementing the circuit using such an amplifier. Okay. So, that amplifier um, is, uh, there is a sort of taken a picture of that here and here is the internal uh, schematic of that and how the elements inside of course this is just broad block of the elements it's made up of huge number of uh, electronic components transistors resistors capacitors which uh, make up basically two op amps a and b okay uh, and so this particular package we will call it has two operational amplifiers which you can use and uh, this operational amplifiers inverting input is connected to the pin 2 which is here this is pin 2 and uh, um, output of that amplifier is here right output of a and this is uh, a inverting right this is a's non-inverting input okay and of course in, in even in either you use one amplifier or two amplifiers there's a common power port for that so this is the V, the negative, this is your PC. Okay. So this is the of this. Now, um, in these corona times, we are, of course, not in the lab and we yeah. are sort of making do with an Arduino system to power our circuits, as you have seen. And also, we are using our oscilloscope uh, to um, apply the signals. So, we need to uh, have an amplifier which operates in this 0 to 5 volt supplied by this, right? So it can supply uh, 0 and 5 volts to the. So the. Uh, and this TL082 uh, is a low voltage amplifier, so it can work with low voltages. However, we need to provide a plus and minus voltage to this. So, of course, that means here we need a plus 5 okay of course ideally this should be uh, uh, so maybe uh, uh, minus 5 but we don't have that luxury right so what we can do is uh, and this is minus such a way that uh, this point here right is actually 0 mm -hmm. that's idea minus 5 0 5 that's what ideally you would need so instead of that what we can do is give we have zero here we have high here plus five and then suppose we give plus 2.5 here then we can have this is equivalent to minus 2.5 with respect to this point and this point is plus 2.5 with respect to this point so we have a plus minus 2.5 system right yeah. so we have five volt available here Okay, which we will use to power this and uh, uh, this capacitor filters out any fluctuations which may be coming from the Arduino and we use a voltage divider these two resistors will act as voltage divider and get equal they are equal values so we get 2.5 here so we have a plus minus 2.5 volt power supply for this operational amplifier so we need to wire that up here or here and of course, uh, we need to give the R2, R1 here. And you can see here, I have chosen uh, 10K and 1K. So what will be the gain for this uh, inverting amplifier? Minus R2 by R1 equal to minus 10, right? So it will invert the signal here. So if it is uh, input is like this, output will be 10 times larger and opposite in size because it's an inverting amplifier 
yeah so we are going to wire this up and these capacitors are there to filter so this capacitor makes sure that the ac gets ground back to us and this will make sure that there's an ac coupling okay so very stable voltage here because of this and uh, this will be the input coming in ac coupled meaning only the fluctuations will get through and we will be able to read the output here right and uh, in, uh, here in this particular scheme i have shown this entire setup to be uh, operating as an erg measurement setup so here is a b sitting and our electrode will be uh, touching the i and then that will be connected to the amplifier because we may need another buffer amplifier which we'll talk about later sitting here but let us say in principle it has to be connected to a gain and that will be digitized using our arduino and stored on a sd card that will hook up if we get time the arduino applies flashes of light which will cause the erg response okay. yeah we are not bothered by that right now so our current aim is to hook up this amplifier using our uh, circuit board here okay so let i have assembled for wiring purposes yeah so i think you can see when i make the connections better so i have assembled the uh, uh, components uh, required for this okay. so if you go here you can see i have assembled all the components required based on all these values i have a 10k 10k 1k uh, this 10 ohm 100 microfarad i think uh, here i have used uh, 10 microfarad and uh, here also i think i'm using 10 microfarad so i'm going to zoom in now and then start wiring do i'll go one by one okay i'll take one element at a time and uh, so i will first take this 10k so here is a 10k I have to connect between 1 and 2. Here the 1 is here, 2 is here because this marker is here. Now, uh, so I am going to take the resistor and connect between 1 and 2. Okay, so now it's connected between 1 and 2. Okay. All this is 1, all this is 2. Okay. Now next I take the next element which is uh, uh, this um, 1k right and then I have to connect between 2 and this capacitor so I can connect it to some free point somewhere from 2 to some free point where I can connect this capacitor so I take the 1k right here and I am going to connect it from 2 to a free end. So 2 to a free end. Right. I have connected from 2 to this end. That is free end. Okay, so now that's one again. Next I want to so I have finished the this one. Oh God. This is connected. Now I want this uh, 10 microfarad so this is an electrolytic electrolytic 10 microfarad capacitor so i will plug it between these two points okay, so if i make, make the positive end is longer so i will have to bend it a bit to get this into this slot okay. so that is connected now so here we have connected between so if you, if you bend this slightly you can see uh, this two was ending here right and then from the two I have connected the capacitor here so this is connected now now we need to connect these two 33 kilohertz so I have this two 33 kilohertz okay which I have to connect between plus here and a hypothetical ground point so plus, plus is 3 and it has to be connected to a hypothetical ground point so let me assign some point here to be the ground okay. so i'll take from point 
3 So I have connected from 3 to the hypothetical ground point. So that's how I need to connect this 33k, this 33k. So I have connected this now over here. Right? I need to connect this 33k from 3 to the 5 volt. So I am going to have my 5 volt. 5 volt is available here in this line. So I have to connect this to that from 3. 3 to that point. Right, so now uh, from 3 to the 5 volt point. This is the 5 volt line. So we have this 5 volt line. It's connected from here to here where the 3 is. Now, next one, so we have covered now these two. Okay. We can connect this one microfarad. So that I used a, a 10 microfarad, which I have to connect from, connect from 3 to the hypothetical ground point. So from 3 to the hypothetical ground point. It is here. I should make sure that these lines are not touching. Here, there's a chance that this line can touch this line. So now we have completed this as well. Right? So what is remaining? We need to have the four uh, connected to the ground and uh, the hypothetical ground point. Right to and this hypothetical ground point is the zero voltage of your Arduino, and that zero voltage is coming to you, you here. Okay, so in, in principle, I want to move this ground to that point, which is the hypothetical ground point over here. Okay, so now this entire uh, line is the hypothetical. Ground and this is the true ground for Arduino. So we need to wire this connection. So I can use a, a, a random wire jumper line to uh, connect four, right? Four to ground. So four is here, right? Because one, two, three. Four and to the ground, hypothetical ground. So it's a true ground with respect to Arduino. So now that is also wired. So this is also done now. This connection. Now we need to connect uh, uh, this power supply line. So I have a ten one here, right, and then I have a. Uh, 100 microfarad here. So I'm going to first wire this uh, wire this 10 ohm, which is coming from the plus 5 voltage to the 8 line. Right. So your 8 is here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 is this point. So we have to wire from um, the right the uh, 10 ohm which will be connected from this to this 8 correct so um so we need to uh, take the 10 ohm and let me put that point here some hypothetical point where i will get the 5 volt to come right so i need to connect from the 5 volt line the Arduino to this 10 ohm. So that is also done. So now this 10 ohm is this 10 ohm is connected from 8 to through this red line to 5 volt, which is same as 8 from this through 10 ohm to the PCC of a 
or 5 volt of the Arduino. Now we also need to make a connection between this 8 and the ground. So we have our button microfarad and 8 is here and our hypothetical ground is here. So I'm going to connect it. Okay. That means a stable filtered power supply. Now, so that means we have now finished this as well as this. So, in principle, now we have wired up all these elements. What is remaining is actually to do the actual powering of the Arduino and also figure out how to give the input. We have our, now I am going to zoom out a little. So, this is our oscilloscope from this signal generator can be connected here. And so, this has to be connected to our input. So, let me keep it here. There are two ways I can connect. I can directly take this and give to the input. And input is what? This free point. Right? This free point here, which is where the capacitive input goes in. This point. This point is same as this line here. Okay. Now we need to power the Arduino. So now Arduino is powered. You can see that powered if I zoom out a little. So that's the slide blanket. So and Arduino is powered. Okay. And so basically now this point should be 5 volt with respect to the ground point. Is that true? We can definitely check. So we take our ground, which is actually the common ground for uh, both um, signal generator and the oscilloscope and connect it to that ground point because this, this line here, right, is the ground line. So I connected the oscilloscope and the signal generator ground to the common point. So I am turning on the oscilloscope okay. and uh, uh, I need to check the voltages. First of all, I need to check whether I am expecting plus 2.5 here with respect to ground and 5 here. Is that true? That will be what is called the biasing of the system. So that's the first thing to check. And for that, I need the uh, oscilloscope to be in DC mode because it's a DC voltage. Currently, it is in the AC mode. So I am going to uh, switch to the DC mode. Coupling is DC. So now it's 0.5 volt. DC and I also want to, because it is going to move from uh, 0 to 5 so I can move the 0 line to be there. So that's what I am going to do. I am going, going to move and offset and then I am going to move this line below. And still it may be the case that uh, our uh, 0.5 into we need 10 divisions. Right. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So it will still go out of bound. So I'm going to go back and scale my range I'm going to change. My range I'm going to increase to 1 volt. So we need to go only 5 divisions. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Okay. So let us check that now. So first of all, we'll check whether our DC voltage is coming. Correct. So this is the point where the DC voltage is, right? So, yeah, so you can see it has gone to this point, which is our expected nearly 5 volt. Okay, 0 and 5 divisions away is 1 volt per division, so 5 volts. Okay, so 5 volt is done. Next, the point is where this 233 ohm joint, uh, which is our uh, point 0.2. Uh, what is the voltage there? We expect it to be 2.5 if the bias is correct. And indeed, true, it is 2.5, 0, 2.5, 5. So it's a 2.5. So our bias is in some sense correct. Right? Now we have directly uh, connected very large voltage uh, signal to this. So let us observe the signal that we have applied. Okay, so that's naturally coming from the signal generator. It should be coming here. We are directly applied here. And it is a square waveform. I want to change it to sinusoid. 
So let me go to what I want the type to change to sign side. So I want the, it to be steady, so I want to change the trigger. So what I want it to be changed. Okay, I have changed the position to green line, so that now it is steadily proceeding. Okay, now what is applied voltage here? Because it's one volt per division. One volt per division, so two division, so two volt peak to peak. So that's the maximum uh, voltage of the signal generator. Okay, and then let us look at let us look at what we can see in the output, which is uh, in the at one. Okay, and so our uh, expectation is that it should be twenty volt, right? Because our gain is ten and it's minus twenty, which should be inverted as we mentioned here but with, without two channels we can't really observe this phase shift so uh, anyway let us look at the scale here but we already know that the voltage can only swing between uh, you know plus or minus 2.5 around the mean so obviously this um, this configuration is not going to be amplified a two volt input to uh, full range so what will be the effect of that so let's look at the output now so the output is at uh, 1, so I am going to connect this to 1 and observe the output. Yeah, so you can see that the output is actually a uh, square wave, right, because and it is ranging between, uh, how many volts it is, 1, 2, 3, 4, 3, 4, 4, so around 4 volt. And so that is the range of the voltage fluctuation allowed uh, in this configuration because we only applied 0 to 5 volt uh, through this power supply, right? So naturally, we cannot use this amplifier in a linear regime if the output is saturating like you see here. So we need to, uh, uh, so often we don't have to because we don't usually apply 2 volt signal because amplifier is used for amplifying or carrying signals long distances and the amplifier voltages are much lower. So just to reduce the voltage input to this system, I am going to put a resistor in here. Okay, so I am using a 10K, I will wire up 10K from here, tapping the input through the 10K and now coupling it to the input. So the, now let us see what is the output under this situation. Okay, so I'm going to measure from one. This is output again, and you find that yeah, indeed, uh, we don't have saturation anymore for in the uh, output. Okay. So mm, now you can calculate whether our theoretical gain, which was uh, minus uh, ten, whether that is true because we uh, can look at the input voltage here and the output voltage okay so let us look at input voltage so what is input voltage here okay, so i need to change the scale i make this ac coupling for a easy measurement okay. yeah so it's an ac coupling i'm taking it off so that when we look at the other voltage high voltage we see that okay so let us measure the input so the input is uh, having one, two, three, nearly four divisions, and the scale is 50 millivolt per division. So four divisions is approximately 450, 200 millivolt, 0.2 volt. So we have applied 0 0.2 volt here. Now let us go and measure the output here. Yeah, so it has become large, and I am going to scale this uh, down, yeah, uh, scale down to measure the resistance, and again usually is 1, 2, 3, 4, nearly 4, and uh, 4 into, and the scale is 0. 0.5 volt per division, so 4 into 0. 0.5, approximately 2, right, so that is uh, 2 volt here, peak to peak, so this was 2 volt, and this was 0 0.2 volt, which means gain, uh, gain equal to 2 by 
0.2 equal magnitude of the gain because the sign as they said we cannot see is approximately 10 and that was our calculation so it's a nicely uh, showing that a nice linear amplifier can be constructed from the high gain amp by using this uh, negative feedback okay. now let us see whether uh, we said that this uh, amplifier is linear right which means that uh, on different different frequencies we should get uh, somewhat similar gain yes, which is 10 now it is not true that uh, it will be having same gain throughout the frequency most amplifiers when the input frequency goes higher beyond a certain point it will start attenuating okay so there is a they act as low pass filters unless we are specifically designed it to extend the bandwidth so is that true that's one thing we will see the other is uh, that's just attenuation of the existing frequency still no new frequency is produced so we will check also whether the shape varies from uh, sinusoid as we change the frequency it's very uh, if it is sinusoid we know that uh, it is and of course we can measure the frequency from here that no new frequency is produced so let us check that so we'll go in now uh, monitor the output which i have actually taken from this bond and put here for convenience so that i can easily hold uh, okay so i will hook that up using the so that i don't have to keep holding the so this enables me to uh, just have a free hand on my oscilloscope. Okay, so now I'm keeping on monitoring the output. I'm going to come and change the uh, frequency. Okay, so currently we are uh, applying uh, two kilohertz. So let us go and change the uh, frequency. Okay, so let us reduce the frequency to the most uh, lowest possible uh, amount. And base and just change it. Yeah, so that is the best we can do. 10 hertz, so that's the lowest we can go to. 10 hertz, and the amplitude is uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, nearly 4 divisions. Okay, so um, it has not attenuated at the lowest frequency we can go to in this uh, system. Now we increase the frequency 20 hertz, 15 hertz. 100 hertz, 200 hertz, 500 hertz, and then we will go and um, change the time base so that we can see the shape. We will decrease the time base so we can see the player. Then we can to the frequency again and continue increasing the frequency. So we see that 500 hertz, still we don't see any distortion in shape, nor do we see uh, any decrease in amplitude, 10 kilohertz, so we go to the time base and still we don't see much change in the amplitude. So 10 kilohertz max we can go on this oscilloscope and it has not distorted nor decreased amplitude. So in most uh, cases uh, uh, we will uh, have a lower cutoff and the upper cutoff for the GF which is the response of this system in terms of frequency so the gain uh, with respect to the frequency that can be uh, decreasing at a very low frequency and also decreasing at a very higher end but the range of our slow scope signal generator is such that uh, at the lowest end, which is at 10 hertz, and at the highest end, which is at 10 kilohertz, which is possible for us, it does not show an attenuation. So, somewhere much below and somewhere much above, you should see the attenuation. Not only attenuation, we don't see any distortion, and the gain is constant. So, we see a constant gain and without any attenuation throughout this range from 10 hertz to 10 kilohertz so the log scale so that's why it is uh, looking as if it is compressed so we can of course go and uh, try and change this capacitor to a lower value this capacitor the input capacitor to a lower value and see whether it will reduce the frequency gain or not. 
so that's what I'm going to do. Input where is that? You want the connection to one k. Now you see that at the highest end is this capacitor, this new capacitor which is for 472 Vx. So it doesn't have any problem. But now we'll reduce the uh, frequency. Okay, 5 kilohertz, 1 kilohertz. Okay, there's a change there. And this. So now clearly you can see that the amplitude has reduced. I'm going to go and reduce the frequency further. And you can clearly see that it is getting attenuated. So by reducing the coupling uh, capacitor here, we can actually visualize visualize this end, this cutoff. You can actually see that it starts falling off. Yeah, at around 5 kilohertz, it is maximized. So we have by this reducing this capacitor to, to from 10 microfarad to 300 pf, we are able to see that this has shifted here. So it is around 5 kilohertz. Okay, so it falls off like that. So definitely the coupling capacitors matter for the cutoff. Similarly, if you decrease this capacitor, that also will have, will have a similar effect if you take an output from here. All this exercise uh, that you should do, okay, uh, it, is, it is possible that you may have to build some amplifiers to quickly pick up circuit. But uh, more importantly, in the process of doing this, you will uh, figure out how to navigate errors in connectivity and what happens with uh, various errors. Actually, I didn't make any errors, but you know, it's quite common for all of us to make errors when we are at the rig. And at the rig, uh, you will be uh, actually having fairly complex uh, uh, circuit, okay, uh, either here or like this. And we need to sort of trace and you know figure out what is going on. So it's a good exercise to do to practice uh, building such uh, circuits so that you are not uh, sort of um, uh, at a loss when you find some bug in your rig. Okay. So amplifier, so it's a linear system as long as we are uh, sticking the input such to the input such a way that the output voltage does not exceed the supply voltage VCC. So it has to be not to not cross plus VCC and minus VCC. Then it will operate in the, the nice uh, linear region. That's what we just saw with this experiment. But it can attenuate the frequencies which are important. Now this method can also be uh, used in the context of the brain uh, in the because this frequency response characteristic tells us right how the uh, signals uh, so at every you can apply a number of sinusoids so low frequency or slightly higher frequency very high frequency and then monitor the output calculate the spectrum of the output that tells us that for example if I ideally when I apply this I should be able to get a spectral peak like that right uh, and if I apply this, maybe I'll get a spectral peak like that. Correct. And if I apply this, but suppose at some point I applied this and I got a spectral shape like that, then you know that the system is uh, not linear. It's producing frequencies which are not present in the input. So it's also a measure of figuring out how uh, how nonlinear the system is and what the system is doing. So this analysis that we carried out is actually a kind of analysis which you will do when you are trying to figure out the nature of the system.